Hello, I'm Alex Gupta with UATV. Today I'm speaking with Joanna Rozinska. She is the Program Director for Europe and Eurasia at the National Endowment for Democracy in Washington, D.C. Hello, Joanna. Welcome to UATV. Hi, thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. I wanted to begin by asking you about what would you say the current state of the press, of the media in Ukraine, as far as freedom of the press, where it stands in relation to other countries in the post-Soviet Union? Well, I would say if you're putting that kind of comparison compared to the former Soviet Union, it's not doing badly, frankly, and it hasn't for a while. But I mean, you hear you have to have Russia, Azerbaijan, and Belarus as kind of the controlling factors. Um, I think that there's a lot of the difficulty with the media in Ukraine tends to be financial. It tends to be the problems with uh, lack of separation of duties or understanding what editorial independence is and respect for editorial independence in media. Um, and so there's a lot of learning to be done on that side of it. But in the sense that the state is not controlling the space is already kind of head and shoulders above a lot of the other countries. There's been uh, Freedom House, or actually it was Reporters Without Borders, commented that safety and loyalty are a big concern for the media in Ukraine and that journalists in Ukraine often have to show their loyalty or actually have their loyalty to the Ukrainian government questioned? To the government? Um, well, I think that that might be a little bit of a, of a new trend as well, right? I think that the allegiance to the owners has been first and foremost, and then what the political position of the media owners is comes into question rather than the state of itself. Um, but I mean, I, I wouldn't necessarily argue with that, but then what does that mean? I mean, the media market in Ukraine is quite large as well, so I think that you also have to start breaking down what part of the media you're talking about, whether you're talking about television, whether you're talking about regional television, whether you're talking about newspapers, and whether you're talking about radio. And so all of these have slightly different different ways of going about it, but I would still say that the allegiance tends to be to the owner of the individual media and the individual stations rather than Ukraine as a state in itself. Um, I think that what they might be referring more to in terms of how coverage of the war in eastern Ukraine looks and how coverage of Crimea and how coverage of internal dissonance might be covered. Um, and that is also kind of a question, a larger question of ethics and integrity of the media itself and also editorial policy, which is what I mentioned before. Um, but this matter ends up being kind of an internal regulatory manner and also the relationship between owners and their staffs and what that's supposed to look like, right? And what a newsroom is supposed to look like and what the interplay between the actors are. So I, is it unique to Ukraine? I don't think so. I think that it might be more exacerbated because there's not that much experience with respect for integrity of the of journalism as a whole. So you're saying a lot sense. of the media organizations in Ukraine, they're controlled by very wealthy oligarchs and you have people in the newsroom, invest, even in journalists, who are beholden somewhat to the interests of the oligarchs? Well, I mean, if you want your paycheck, that's rather normal, isn't it? But I think that it's more beholden on the owners of the individual entities to demonstrate that they respect journalistic integrity, right? I mean, it's, it's a, it's a two-way street a little bit. I mean, as a journalist, because you're an employee, obviously you're going to be in a weaker position, but so therefore the onus is on the editorial staff and on the publishers or on the owners of the media to demonstrate that they're willing to respect integrity of a newsroom, which they don't tend to, is what I'm saying. You've been, I know, working with Ukraine in Ukraine a long time. You're based in Washington, D.C., but how is Ukraine done in, let's say, in the last five, ten years with regard to the press, and specifically investigative journalism. I want to focus on that. I want to focus on that. I think it's, it, it's you know, two steps forward, three steps back a little bit, right? Um, I mean, in terms of investigative journalism, there's certainly been a lot more investment in it. Um, and I don't think that that's necessarily a bad thing. It, 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 it starts begging the question of 
if you're going to do lots of investigative reports, you still need a place to publish them, and you still need to have an audience to read them. Producing them in and of itself is is valuable on one hand, but you have to think of what your end audience is. And and my concern would be that it starts becoming an artificial creation a little bit that has very little to do with actual journalism. Um, now, what else can I say about it? So, I, and I think that it's still, you know, one, one of the difficulties with journalism in Ukraine also ends up being a lack of systematic methodology and professionalism within the industry, I think. Um, you know, there's a lot of journalists that are produced every year out of Ukrainian universities, and a lot of people have raised questions about the, the quality of the education that they get, um, and that there are a number of factors. So on one hand, like how they are taught, and the preparation, and the lack of training, um, and then the second is the lack of editorial oversight, that they're sometimes there's a tendency to cut corners and be sloppy about research. Um, and, you know, the stringency and the importance of verifying sources, of getting another opinion, of always getting a second opinion to a statement, right? So that you're not always editorializing, but you're actually putting together a coherent, balanced argument, um, I think tends to be lacking a little bit in Ukraine, or it certainly can be worked on. But again, I think that, that it's the, the problem with the entire ecosystem, right, is that um, if you don't have editors that are looking for quality materials and insisting on this from journalists, and on the other hand, there's very little, there's a very little motivation on the part of journalists to do that because they're not necessarily writing for um, a defined audience like a newspaper does, then things end up kind of like fraying at the edges, I think, a little bit. I wanted to ask you about the... Ukraine government outlawing Russian social media sites, as well as the Russian TV station Dozhd. Would you be able to comment? Uh, how much does this worry you? How significant is this? So, so I will say that this is in my personal opinion. I won't say this necessarily as as an institutional statement from Ned. So that's my my disclaimer there. I think that it's while the rationale is understandable given the circumstances that Ukraine finds itself in and I'm not unsympathetic to it I do think that it sets a rather dangerous precedent um, generally banning things outright is not what democracies do um, and it might not be the best way to counteract it either right um, you know having to deal with disparate views and again fully understanding what particularly in the in the case of the the social media what the perceived dangers are on the Ukrainian side again I, I would worry about the precedent that it sets going forward what since you've been working with Ukraine and not just with regard to the media but what in Ukraine have you seen in the last I would say three years that you've seen be really positive, that you've been very glad to see happen, a good step for Ukraine? I think that the most fundamental change that I see um, that is most positive is a re-examination of the relationship between the authorities and the public, right? Um, that you don't have this idea of a top-down lack of communication from the grassroots to the authorities, but there is a changing relationship there in the power structures that on one hand a greater acknowledgement of the role of citizens in governing the country and a sense of responsibility on the other side to its citizens not perfect obviously there's still an awful long way to go I think it's something that's more uh, palpable on the regional and local level than it is in Kiev for example um, but I still have hope that it'll filter up and then eventually start filtering back down. For me, I mean, the, the, the idea of decentralization is probably key here as well in terms of changing that dynamic and changing that conversation. Uh, and in order to move forward, I think that that's the biggest step to take. Um, but it certainly is more, it has become increasingly obvious over the past three years that there's a, a feeling of vested interest in the country uh, by its citizens and a joint responsibility in ruling it. So you, you're saying that there's been a lot more focus on localization, on bringing uh, people in Ukraine to the forefront, around the country, not just in Kiev. Uh, 
Well, I think that it's not even bringing people to the forefront that they feel that they have a role to play now, right? That um, that they have a that they're somehow vested in the future of their own country as a state, right? Not as an idea or as a concept, but but in kind of the brass tacks of it. So um, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying that I think that you feel it more on the local and regional level than you do in Kiev itself. And going from that, my final question. What have you been the most disappointed about that you've seen in the last few years? <laughs> uh, the lack of political will um, that, that you would have thought that um, there was a greater understanding that you can't maintain the status quo and you can't even, and you certainly can't go to the status quo ante from before the Maidan, that a recognition that something has fundamentally changed. There's been a tectonic shift um, in society and that you have to respect that if you don't want it to back up on you. Um, and that selling people platitudes and empty promises is just not going to wash this time, I don't think. Um, that that the on the leadership level, and I say this writ large because I mean whether it's through the bureaucracy or whether through it's the elected leaders, but that the wave that they rode in on in terms of respecting what the will of the people was de facto, that they don't play that and they don't break that respect, right? Um, I think that that's that's disappointing that they're not learning certain basic levels. Sorry, that they're not learning certain basic lessons that they should have taken out of all this. Um, and that there's not a greater sense of statesmanship, frankly, on the part of the leadership. Um, that in order to move forward, you do have to actually believe in public service and you do have to dedicate yourself to public service and that concept of public service mm -hmm. rather than cynicism. Um, that, that's been a little bit disappointing to watch. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I know the National Endowment for Democracy does a lot of work in Ukraine and this part of the world. There's a hundred other questions I could ask you about, many other topics. <laughs> Unfortunately, we're running out of time, but will you come back? Absolutely, if you'll have me. Oh, we absolutely will. Thank you so much for joining us, really appreciate it. Thank you, have a good day. You too. I'm Alex Gupta with UATV. I was speaking with Joanna Rozinska. She is with the National Endowment for Democracy in Washington, D.C.